Good afternoon or good morning, everybody, and thanks, Pat, for uh, that introduction. I just want to say before I start, uh, thank you to the IIEA for um, hosting this conference. It's a great opportunity, I think, for all of us, uh, some of us to speak, but all of us to listen, and uh, particularly in the Q&As, I think it's very instructive to hear uh, similar themes and issues coming up that we all need to address here in Ireland when we, when we shape this for success. Um, just in terms of my, my own role in AIB as head of uh, personal banking, part of my remit is um, the consumer finance side of the business. I also spent 15 years myself in the capital market side of the business and have been directly involved in financing everything from toll roads through PPP to, uh, to the, uh, the mobile licenses. So from an infrastructure perspective, happy, happy to take any questions on the end, but that's not the side I'm going to focus on today, obviously. Just in terms of what I am going to focus on, I'm going to talk, um, first of all, to a piece you'll all be very familiar with, but I think it's critical to our understanding, which is, what is it the consumer needs from us? Um, if, we, if we truly look to match that need, and we do it in a viable way, and we keep the costs down, then this will be successful. There's no doubt, um, speaking from personal experience, uh, having financed everything from golf courses to, to bridges, um, if, you, if you do it in a, in a viable way, backed by cash flow, it, it will work. That's the first thing. The second thing, um, having talked about the consumer, I'm going to briefly talk about some of the industry challenges, but, for, but, but with a financier's perspective. And then I'm going to share with you our own experience to date. Um, I'll, I'll give you some stats on that and a, and a very open view on how that's worked, which will bring me full circle back to when you marry the customer experience, the banking experience, and the industry challenges, and what the customer journey should look like what does that then instruct us to do in the financing side? And I'll just talk to some of the financing options. As a happy accident, actually, I'm, I'm not going to talk to um, the, the options that uh, Lisa spoke to, not because um, you know, they're not viable, they absolutely are, but more so because we're looking to it from the size of the Irish market, I suppose, and the perspective of what we feel works for the Irish market. But um, clearly, uh, there are a number of options, and there are a number of options discussed in uh, Joe and Josephine's um, very well put together documents uh, that the IIEA uh, produced there just this week. Um, so just, just to, to take you to the... Um, I hope I'm holding this the right way now. Yes, great. Um, just to talk to the consumer need very briefly, because you're all going to be very familiar with this, I'm just going to look at it from, the, from the, really the banking perspective. The first thing is, when a, when a personal customer comes and talks about what they're looking for, they talk about savings. But all of the research, our own and indeed the research um, from the IEA and the HES and others, tells you that afterwards customers don't tend to know what their savings were. But they do notice the comfort. And in terms of customer advocacy, which is one of the key things, particularly in the Irish market, we find in every piece of research we do, one of the most powerful um, movers on the demand dial in Ireland is getting people to say, I did this, it was easy and it works. So that, that, that customer advocacy piece, particularly in the promotion that was talked about early, earlier on, is, is really critical. Ease of execution, I'll talk to a lot. How do we make this from an industry's perspective easy to understand and easy to deliver? Very briefly, from a business perspective, it's much more hard-nosed. That return on investment has to be actually evident and those proofs of savings have to be evident to them. But that's clearly doable, and I think the examples given to us earlier of Eli, Eli Lilly and others um, are good examples of that. We've had plenty of experience of companies coming to us, and they know what we're doing, they're doing. And we're, while we're not energy experts, we're happy to have an engineer certify for us at an industry level what those cash flow perspectives are, and then they're bankable. Um, the corporate social responsibility is one we tend to forget, but for big brands, it does help. And it helps the story and the advocacy piece and the feel-good factor. And lastly, we're all playing into this one, which is the national priorities. Um, we all know about the EU targets. They've been talked about. Um, thankfully, it, it isn't a penalty-based structure, but it could move that way. And actually, 
I think the penalties will be self-imposed by us if we don't get this right. We, we don't need the EU to do that. The, the importance of the savings and the efficiency for us as an exporting nation and our, our competitiveness is absolutely vital, particularly when you see the type of savings that, that can be made. In terms of just understanding the Irish market, I'm just going to talk from a pull and a push perspective. And I think part of the dynamics, particularly when you see our experience so far, has been very often in a, in a new industry where you're relying on early adopters. It's very much around timing um, and, and, and getting that timing right. And in terms of the demand curve, we've had the early adopters. We've had that, if you like, enhanced by grants, which are highly likely to leave. And it's really a question of how do we move that demand curve dial forward. That's down to the cost effectiveness and the ease of access for consumers and for business users alike. The golden rule was mentioned earlier um, and I have a question mark after it because we know it's not going to be a guarantee but I think if that can be used particularly in the marketing and what we find again and again in our research we're very very different from the Germans actually and um, this research goes back over 10 years consistently Irish consumers, when they're looking for a loan, the first thing they look for, and this is backed by our own research, will the bank say yes to me? It's the embarrassment factor, it's the approachability. Do I understand the formula? How do I put this to the bank? The second thing they look for isn't price, it's affordability. So it's a bit like when you go in to buy a car, how much will it cost me per month? And I think that's critical in the solution. If you say to somebody 210 euro per month, but you're only going to say 500 euro per year, you have to be able to say it's going to cost you 60 euro per month, and it's the affordability, it's what can I pay out of my pay packet every week or every month that, that, that's critical, and the golden rule plays a part, whether it's guaranteed or not, been able to show that in a very straightforward way, particularly in the promotion. Obviously the cost effectiveness, and then I've mentioned the access and incentives, which I will come back to. The push factors, unfortunately, are becoming much more prevalent. I won't speak to them other than to mention rising fuel costs, colder weather. Um, the levies can be a carrot or a stick in the sense that they can be, I think, platformed in to be, um, if you like, an encouragement to invest. Uh, particularly one thing as a nation we can do more of is to give people advanced warning of where, where taxes and prices are going to go if you don't take energy efficient um, initiatives yourself. And if there's one thing we're very good at as a nation, and I think the conversion to the euro, um, we were the fastest country to convert. Irish people understand finance and they understand the dynamic of what something's going to cost them. They're very good at that. Is this enough? I think I, I've put it there at the bottom um, in green, which isn't an accident. Um, the customer experience, do I understand it? Do I want it? Is it easy to do? And that's the advocacy piece. And is it worthwhile? I have a colleague of mine here today from our facilities management area. And the right-hand side of this um, box is really a, a credit to them. And I'll be in trouble if I don't mention um, our own corporate social responsibility in terms of what we've done in energy efficiency ourselves. We reduced our carbon footprint by 15% between 2007 and 2010. And we're, you know, we're not an energy user in the way that a Pfizer would be. But given um, the number of buildings we have, that's quite a significant saving. And we've done some win-wins, for example, e-statements, but, but they're minor in terms of what they're going to do for the environment, I will acknowledge. This is just a backdrop to coming into the customer journey very briefly in terms of some of the research findings to date that 85% of customers and consumers have used savings and only 15% have sought finance, which talks to my earlier slide. And that average spend is quite low and significantly below what a deeper retrofit would require. Um, and so our financing mechanisms, when we come to talk about that, have to encourage those who are prepared to do deeper retrofit if they find that they don't have sufficient savings to actually use the financing um, that is available. Interesting, while 47%, almost half, um, having, having said that they were going to invest for savings, they weren't clear what the savings were afterwards. And I think the next one is probably the most important one in terms of our conversation today. Lack of own funds is cited as the main reason for not proceeding. 
these are direct quotes, I only take out loans when absolutely necessary, was an answer from 43% of the participants in that TGI survey, which was only last year. And if there's something I want, I save up for it. Now, I do think that's been impacted by the economic climate that we're in, um, and probably also experience, it's fair to say. We also know from our own research and Amorix research that the primary focus of customers now is paying down debt, particularly home mortgage, and the secondary focus is on saving money. So we just have that challenging backdrop. But that won't be like that forever. And I think the one thing I would say to that myself is that lending to somebody who wants to invest in energy efficiency, if you think of the mindset of someone who does that, whether they're a consumer or a business, is a very good risk. It's a very good mind that has had the, had the head on them to think about that. Um, and that does make a huge difference. Um, you know, when you think of the other options in terms of consumer finance, that's a pretty good one. This is just, I, I won't go through all of this, but I think it's really important for all of us who are playing in the industry to make this journey easier. It's quite fractured at the moment. The Chevrons, um, excuse me, um, the Chevrons are quite separate. And, you know, I, I've deliberately put an arrow at the end of those chevrons. That needs to be a journey that, that flows quite seamlessly, and we all play a role in that. From creating the customer awareness, these slides will be available, so I, I won't walk through, but, but they're obvious. Is the customer aware, which brings us back into the promotion. Um, it doesn't have to be national TV. There can be shop fronts, et cetera, um, but, but that helps. Um, unlocking the demand, so explaining those invest to save options that are available, involving everybody um, from the marketeers to the suppliers to the financiers. Having accredited, that's come up several times today, um, and an accredited, um, and I think it was Mr. Kelly who mentioned, not just accredited suppliers, but the accredited assessment advice, I, I think is, is, is a very important point, um, and finding a dynamic to do that reliable installation, and lastly, finance, which I'm going to talk to, whether that's via the energy bill, whether it's via white labeling, and these are all options that are under, under discussion um, in a working group at the moment, whether it's direct loans. And we have to allow for people who want to use their savings. Um, so there's one thing we have to remember, um, particularly in, in propositions and, and the marketing of these. At the end of the day, what we're doing here is providing a service. We're facilitators. Finance lubricates the proposition. It isn't the proposition itself. When someone buys a car, they're thinking about the engine, the speed, the oil consumption. Finance is a hygiene factor, but it's a hygiene factor that has to work very effectively in the middle of all that. We're a bit like the dentist. You just want to make the experience as pleasant as possible, but nobody really wants to experience it in the first place. The, um, the retrofit industry challenges, I think, have been covered a lot, so I'll, I'll walk through these very quickly um, in terms of the, 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 the questions that bankers are asking as, as we sit in a working group at the moment is what is the size of the market? I mean, just a little, a little insight, there's 44 million metres in the UK. That makes, that's attractive to pension funds. There's 4 million metres in Ireland, just to, just to put a, a perspective on it. But I think that means that the solutions lie in the island of Ireland. You know, we've made lots of industries viable here despite the size of our nation. And uh, we're, we're very conscious, we're a very cost-conscious nation. So there are, there are um, opportunities there for us to make this work. Um, I mentioned cost-effectiveness, and I think in that, the third last point there, leveraging expertise and competencies without adding to the cost. So we can't, if we, the more, if we layer cost into this proposition, we're taking away from the savings. And, and that's not the place to go. So we need to keep those costs, everything from the legal advice costs to the financing costs, to a level that's commensurate with making it viable, but not too expensive. And I think um, somebody talked about the prevalence of, of promotion. Part of that is education, uh, making consumers the, the agents of change, and championing advocates at every opportunity that we can. Um, you know, Brian Motherway speaking this morning on Morning Ireland and, and speaking to people in a language they understand. I think we've all a responsibility in that regard in terms of using every opportunity to, um, to make this visible. I, I, I'd encourage you to look at the agri lobby in Ireland. Um, you know, I, I think retrofit needs a lobby, frankly. Um, I think that everybody in this room could play a part in that. But the concept of actually deciding that you're going to make this visible 
and, and, and structuring a very focused lobby around getting, getting this on every agenda and mostly the consumer and the business um, agenda is, is, is worth thinking about. Um, and it will help that appetite to invest. So here's the page I've all been waiting for, the, uh, the financing options. I'm only covering some of them. Um, they are all under consideration with a working group, and I'll just walk through at a very high level um, how, how they work, from what's most similar to a conventional um, to what I would call a heavy, a heavy joint venture and then a light uh, joint venture perspective. Um, there, there's definitely, in the second one, um, absolute uh, room for a PPP type structure. Um, I'm the key thing about a PPP structure, having been involved with them in the past, is making sure that cash flow is, uh, is, is very tangible. So starting with the first one, which um, banks have a tendency to want to see and an appetite for, a conventional but visible finance proposition. So that's, that's saying, well, why don't we use the banking facilities that are there? I think that uh, I'd be the first to admit there are a couple of things at a minimum that would have to be done in that regard. First of all, the industry would have to agree on a standard application form and make the front end very simple. Um, we'd have to make streamlined decisioning. And speaking to that first point that consumers tell us in research, which is, will you give me the money if I come in? Don't embarrass me. A formula-based, and this is an industry, a la the golden rule, where the concept of... Um, putting a formula forward works quite well. Frankly, is it enough? It could be, but I've, I've spoken about the 2007 experience we've had ourselves, and I think we do have to go further than that um, as an industry at this point, and I'll come back to that. The second option speaks very closely to what we've heard already in the sense of a one-stop shop joint venture, the likes of an energy bank a pre-funded joint venture fully functioning from the marketing at the front end all the way back to the finance. Um, and you could have a number of streams of pension uh, funds here, everything from bank funding, pension funding, um, government um, levy um, payments in, in terms of um, financing an element of it, um, all the way down to commission-based payments, depending on how the, the industry structures it, and an involvement of utilities. You, you can pay through the utility bill or you can pay directly. We, you know, the, the pay as you save is a model that I, I had intended talking to, but I think it's been very well described by the, by the previous speaker. Um, happy to take any questions on that afterwards, so I, I won't talk to that now. Um, and then all of the payments are, everything's fronted by the energy bank um, with financial institutions potentially playing a role from financiers to, to just credit assessors in the background. The challenges with this one, are you're replicating the processes that are already available in the financing system around credit assessment, um, managing debt, um, provisioning. You, look, you, you have to have a, a banking license, and um, you have the governance of that. And you know what's been worked through at the moment is, is the demand sufficient to warrant the cost of that? That's still been worked through and it would be unf unfair to call it. It's definitely a structure that can work, but in a market of this size, we have to be very careful. This is one area where you have to be very careful not to layer in more cost than the savings that you're, you're providing. And, and, and that's up to those that structure to make sure of that. The third option then, the cross-industry alliance. When I use this word, I am adamant that this can't be some kind of loose alliance. This has to be a formal alliance underpinned by contracts if, 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 it's, if it's going to work, in, in my view, and that's my, my personal view um, in terms of the discussion so far. And before I describe this to you, I'm going to use an analogy from the motor industry. You go into a garage and you're thinking of buying a new car. Before you leave, most garage forecourts will say to you, would you like to finance that? In some cases, they've got a pre-agreed supplier. In some cases, they'll give you a choice of financiers. So picture forward, you've got a very strong lobby for the energy industry. You've got the visibility of maybe an agreed and shared marketing front with both government, levies, commissions, utilities, banks uh, being involved in that. And you have a front end, whether that's electricity shops or whatever front end uh, the, the industry would agree, 
where somebody can come in on that customer journey, the chevrons I showed, and say, I'd like to understand what I can do in my retrofit um, in my home or in my business. And we, we can take that all the way at that front end and in that formal alliance from awareness to execution in a fully streamlined process, which takes all the benefits of the previous uh, streamlined application form used the same throughout all of the banks, preferably a streamlined application form that covers off the needs of everybody from the energy company to the bank, all in the one form, fully streamlined with an accessible sales engagement at the front end. And behind that are the banks, whichever one of them are chosen by the consumer, it's the consumer's choice, then underwrites that keeping the costs down, agreeing to do it on a formula, and the only basis on which they would refuse to do this, and, and this is a prerogative that one has to retain, is if it is known for some reason that that's, that's going to be a bad debt, and that, that, um, that answer goes straight back to the customer, not, not, not via a, a supplier or provider. So there is a, a, an example of, very like the uh, motor industry, where an awful lot of the infrastructure, the IT and the costs are already embedded and they can be leveraged. That's scalable, um, not just to the retrofit industry, but to others. Um, and, and that's another one that's on the table at the moment. But I suppose from, from my perspective, and I can say this on behalf of AIB, I mean, this is potentially a, a 14 billion to a 20 billion industry. You know, even if, if, if a third of that is financed, there's definitely a business opportunity here for everybody in the room if we, if we use our mindset and, uh, and, and put our minds to it. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to say that. I've spoken to a lot of this already in terms of the, uh, the ownership issue on the, on the joint venture. Um, the risk share becomes an issue that needs to be fleshed out if um, we have participants um, particularly sharing in a bill. It was referred to by an earlier speaker. Um, you know, if you have somebody who hasn't paid and they're electing to pay one or the other, there is a slight divergence of requirements there. If a bank has an unpaid bill, it quickly starts to eat into capital in terms of how Basel charges, um, whereas an energy company doesn't, doesn't charge for that and isn't providing in the same way. So it, it's work throughable, but there's a, there's a lot of work to be worked through there. And if a customer is in difficulty, and part of that bill is an energy bill and part of it is a bank bill. You're talking about two customer and difficulty regulators. You're talking about the energy regulator and the bank regulator. So I think there probably would be a need for some legislative change there. But listening to the minister this morning, I think there's an appetite to go that road and, and to facilitate the industry in that way, which is, which is good to hear. Um, in fact, it was mentioned earlier, are we lending to the consumer or are we lending to the meter? And there are legal issues been worked through there. I think it was well covered earlier. Um, I've just mentioned some of them. But in terms of um, the consumer, that's a well-tried formula in terms of recourse to the consumer. There are some challenges in the, in the meter um, provision that are still being worked through, um, particularly in terms of vacant property and therefore unpaid. But I, I think there are structures that can be looked at there. And I think they will be different in Ireland to the UK market just because of the size of the market in terms of how that might pan out. But th that's uh, under active discussion at the moment. And finally, there are lots of opportunities in how the, the repayment will be collected, be it the utility bill directly by the, by the lender. Um, we have to be careful, too, of interest rate fluctuations. The last thing we want is somebody getting an energy bill that's going up because interest rates are going up. Now, there are ways of, of playing in fixed rate funding there, but it's just another factor to be considered. The bad debt collection. There may be a level of IT development, which in the current environment we'll all want to keep to a minimum because that has to be passed on to the consumer and there are regulatory considerations. So to come full circle back um, to the market size and business case, there's no doubt there's a market there. We've, we've spoken earlier about the, a, a minimum um, 14 billion of a market. But the market becomes a market of one when somebody comes into you and says they want to, f to retrofit their home or retrofit their business. And when it becomes a market of one, every penny counts. And that brings me full circle to making sure whatever structure we put in here, we have to remember every penny counts and structured in such a way that it is cost effective. I'm going to quote Brendan Halligan now in terms of a, a, a recent thing he said, um, which struck me um, in terms of the momentum that we need here. We do have to move with speed, but he cautioned on haste. 
And I, I think the point there is that uh, we have a lot to do before 2020, and I don't think we have too long of a comfort zone in getting this going, because it will take time to build momentum, it'll take time to get the legislative and the structures right. And every year that passes is another 100,000 homes and another 100,000 um, opportunities for the building industry and for the banking industry. So we, we do need to move at speed here. Um, and I think as an industry, the fact there are so many people here, I think is a good sign in terms of the fact that we're about that. Um, I do think the interests are aligned in summary. Um, this is a quality lending opportunity. I've said that already once we get the structure right. From our perspective, it supports the community ethos. It supports business, open for business and employment. Um, it supports economic investment and recovery if it's structured for viability. And the critical thing for us is, is to make it easy and seamless. I'll finish by leaving you two contact names, which, which will be on the, uh, my own. If, if there's anything you'd like to ask me or if you have any ideas that, that we haven't covered off that you'd like to play into the discussion, we'd be very happy to hear from you. And the second gentleman there who um, is in the audience today, John Hearn, um, is, is the head of consumer finance for AIB and he has his product development manager, Esther Ashfield, with him today as well. So um, they're available to talk to you during coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you.